listening to 99.3 Nigeria Info FM Lagos. It's Wednesday. Yvonne just gave you the business news update. So you know it's time for the glass ceiling. How do we protect widows' rights? I'm still talking about widows. Yes, it's International Youth Day. But we need to remember that young people and middle-aged women are widowed every day as well. Last week, we had somebody who called in and told us about her friend who was 23 years old. Somebody else called in and told us about her friend who was 25. Some of our mothers were widowed when they were that age as well. And the age of youth is between 15 and 29. So this conversation affects the youth as well. There are terrible, terrible things that happen to women when they lose their husbands. We've been talking about it for the past few weeks. And they're happening to young people as well. So today, let's talk some more about that. But let's also talk solutions, right? We're going to be talking about how we can strategize, uh, what strategies have worked in other aspects of social justice. And we'll talk about how we can apply those things uh, to widows' rights. Now, today, it's not just you and I talking, Lagos. I have women who have successfully fought battles and are still fighting battles. Since it's, it's, it's uh, International Youth Day, uh, they're also young women. And so they're in the studio talking to us um, about what young people are doing. So that you can see that young people are not just talking. huh? They're doing stuff. Young people are everywhere. They're walking the talk. They're in every facet of, of our society. They're doing amazing things in spite of the system. And they're finding ways to make things better. So let's meet our amazing guests. The first person is the Executive Director of Education as a Vaccine, Buki Williams. Welcome uh, to The Glass Ceiling. Thank you. Glad uh, to be back. Yes. And then our second guest is a founder of uh, NG Women in PR. She's a public relations and communications consultant. She's also a retail business advisor. She's Power Patch. Tolulokbe or Lauren Darrow, thank you so much for joining us on Hard Facts. Thank you, Sandra. It's a pleasure to be here. We are expecting our third guest. She's the founder of Market March. It's a movement that is working to end harassment of women in marketplaces and other public spaces. Damilola Marcus. Hopefully she joins us on the show before it's over. Um, so let's talk about uh, NG Women in PR. Why did you found it and uh, what did you try to do with it? Okay, um, Nigerian Women in PR is a community of um, public relations and communications female professionals who are of Nigerian descent, who practice anywhere across the world, right? It's a community I founded because when I started in public relations, um, it was a bit difficult for me to get mentorship in that space. Um, I was very almost desperate to get a woman whom I could speak to and just watch how her career has gone and then perhaps learn from it, whether it was from afar or just having a conversation with the person. I practically slept on LinkedIn when I started when I started it out in PR and um, communications, and it was just very difficult for me to find um, a senior public relations female professional who had the type of skill set that I required and who was also willing to share knowledge that she had gained as she moved. Um, over the course of her career. Mm. And so it, it had been something that I had in mind just as I started um, working in public relations and um, communications. And in April last year, I just woke up one Sunday and I said, I think it's time. <laughs> and so it wasn't like I thought about the name. I just, the name of the community is exactly what it is. Mm. It is a community for Nigerian women in PR, mm -hmm. wherever they are in the world, whatever country you're practicing in, mm -hmm. it's just a community for people who are just coming into the profession, who are young professionals, who are mid-level mid -level professionals, mm -hmm. who are senior executives and board director level um, professionals, mm -hmm. just to also have a melting pot, a meeting point where you can share your experience, somebody coming up can learn from you, you can learn from them, mm -hmm. and just cross-pollinate ideas to make sure that the, the, the profession and the career really mm. um, 
keeps being um so that people know that it's a it's a vi- a viable career to want to go into mm-hmm. and know that there are prospects there it's not a dead end mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. you tweeted that, recently you tweeted recently yeah. about wanting to set up something to teach more women the path to financial freedom now we already know that a lot of the time Women are at the financial heart of their families, right? They're either yes, providing yes. or they are managing the finances or they're doing both. So how do we explain the contradiction where women have such a heavy financial role but lack financial freedom or the knowledge to achieve it? Mm. Well, okay, so so that's interesting. Um Obviously, I'm a very strong proponent of um, financial empowerment for women, mm-hmm. right? Whether you're a career person, whether you're just a pepper seller, mm-hmm. I, I'm very strongly for um, the argument that women should be financially independent, mm-hmm. regardless of the financial status of any man or any other person mm-hmm. in your life. Mm-hmm. And this any other person could be another woman. So long as you're a woman, you're an adult, you should be financially independent, have a means mm. of having income for yourself, an income that you determine what happens to, not subjected to any other person, mm. right? So that's something I'm very um, big on. And the reason maybe is not too far-fetched. My, my father died when I was 10 years old. Okay. And at that time, my mom was, um, I think she was 34. Okay. So it's now that I have my own children that I begin to really appreciate the things that she had to go through. Mm. Right? She had three kids. And thankfully for her, let me tell you, mm. that one of, the re- one of the reasons that the family were able to still stay with her after my father died mm-hmm. was because she was not only um, a civil servant, mm-hmm. she had petty businesses that we were all involved in. We're selling Ives blocks. We're selling rice, mm. we're selling pure water, we're selling bottled water, we sold everything, mm-hmm. right? So by the time I got into Polytechnic at first, in fact, I understood what it meant to do business, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. In my hostel, while I was in the Polytechnic, mm-hmm. I opened a boutique, so if you know how what a, a dorm room looks like, mm-hmm. you have your own bed space. Just at the wall, at the back of my bed space, I had my boutique there. By the time I got into university, I started supplying biscuits, locally made um, Nigerian bread, um, shortbread biscuits, mm-hmm. to three other states, right? So I was very um, open to doing business because that's all I'm used to, hmm. right? And so because of that, as I became an adult and fully came into my own, I began to realize how blessed I am, really, to even understand that it's important for me to be financially free and independent. There are just some decisions you cannot take if you don't have a source of income. Hmm. There are some opportunities you cannot even think of accessing if you don't even know where the money is going to come from. Hmm. And this is me even saying that as a full-time career person, I still had side hustles. I had side businesses from a properly structured um, public relations consulting firm Mm -hmm. to me selling diapers online. Right, just to make sure that that, and it's not because I was hard up for money, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't like I was lacking, it was just make sure you keep your hands busy, mm. right? Mm. And I told you, son, while we were chatting about this, I have two friends mm-hmm. who were unfortunately widowed. One was widowed at 27, mm-hmm. some 11 months before, um, just after she got married. Mm-hmm. Friend is as industrious as I am, mm-hmm. but when she got married, for whatever reason, she stopped working. Hmm. By the time my spouse died, she had just had a baby who was four months old and she wasn't working. Hmm. I cannot begin to narrate to you the horrors that she went through. But she's picked up now and she's back on the grind. Good. I have another friend who lost her husband some three years ago. She was working, but then even though she was working, it has still been a very big struggle. Hmm. Right? Hmm. So anything can happen at any time. And that's why it's just always good. Even if you don't have a ready fall, a, um, cash to readily fall back on, but that you are industrious and you can quickly find something to do with your hands, with your mind, that brings in income. So that you are not fully dependent on what one family says because you are married and there's something that's happened to their son mm. and you are now waiting on, so come, let, let them come and share the property. Mm-hmm. No, because kids' school fees is not going to wait because somebody died and they need to read the wills before money is shared, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in a situation where you would have to go and beg 
one family member to say, please, while they are still talking about how to share the will, mm -hmm. let's find a way to pay the school fees. If you are a person in your own rights, right, you can take such decisions um, for yourself and for the children. I'm also very strong for any woman. Honestly, let me just close the door so that my husband would not hear me. I'm not sure he's listening. <laughs> Honestly, let me, let me whisper it to you. Mm -hmm. And this is not this is just me being very realistic, right? Mm -hmm. Just know that as you have kids, God will bless you and the spouse or your partner that you come with. Make sure that you have the funds to take care of those kids yourself, just in case anything can happen. Anything. We can don't happen. pray for it. You may need to step in to support your spouse. There can be job loss. Imagine if there's job loss on the, the partner side and you are just there, you are waiting for daddy to come and give us money for for um, seasoning or salt. Everybody is just stranded and looking at the ceiling. That's when the strength of the woman shows that she's, she's able to do any Well, of course, anything legally within bounds, but then she's very industrious. That's what makes us this woman, right, where you can say that you can do, you can function in multiple places mm. and handle multiple responsibilities without breaking down because that's that's what your composition is hmm. let me come to uh, uh, bukola bukola what types of programs does education as a vaccine run what's your role as executive director um Thanks again for having me on. So as the executive director, I did not start the organization. I took over mm. from a young woman who founded the organization when she was 21, okay. actually. Mm -hmm. And the organization has now been in existence for 20 years. So I took over from her in 2016. And the goal of our organization is, one, we want to advance the right to health for adolescents and young people, and we want their freedom from violence. So a lot of the work that we do is around addressing the key sexual reproductive health challenges that mm. people face in Nigeria. So we go from addressing, um, you know, child marriage to girl education, to access to information and services that are youth-friendly, that are accurate, um, addressing negative gender norms that leads to a culture of silence around violence, especially adolescent women and girls, issues adolescent teenage pregnancies, violence against children, and also just knowing that within the context that we live in, there's a lot of poverty and food insecurity and livelihood insecurity. So a lot of our work is also how do we contribute to that mm. through the lens of health. So mm. a lot of the projects that we've been doing recently, so for example, in Nasarawa State, we're currently running a project in which we've been looking at community peace structures. Mm. And a lot of them were set up because of the pastoralist headman conflict. And a lot of it was around helping to resolve um, family issues. And we realized that a lot of cases around violence was being reported mm. um, to these community peace uh, structures, but they did not have the capacity. They did not understand the issues around them. So mm. a lot of it was, one, we were training them to understand that violence is, is not, you know, it's not normal, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if traditionally culture says that and two we noticed that very few of them actually had women in the committee so a lot of our work was around how do we you know include women and that's work that's been supported by the french embassy we also have a, a you know project right now that we're going to start pretty soon which is you know forming a young mother's club for young women because a lot of women just because they have babies or because they have children don't know much about contraceptives and it's going to be in bainway states and some in parts of fc All right. Sorry about that. We're going to um, get that connection back up. I think uh, Dami Lola is trying to join the conversation and that's what's um, tripped up the phone call. Dami, you just you just knocked off a bunch of other uh, you just b knocked off a bunch of other people that we had on the call. All right. So they'll figure that out. My tech team is, is working hard to figure that out and then um, we will solve that problem. All right, Lagos, you're listening to Hard Facts on 99.3 through Nigeria Info. We have Bukola back on the line. Bukola, hi. Sorry about that uh, interruption. Hey, what happened? Am I talking <laughs> Sorry All about right. that. Uh, okay, so Tunde, if you're listening, uh, Dami has a different um, Skype ID, so that's the one you're going to need to um, 
add in the conversation. She has a different one. So she, the one that just called that that she declined, and I also called as well. That's the one you should be trying to call at the moment. So back to you, uh, Buki. Uh, can you tell me what led you into this line of work? How do you? How did you get your start? What led you here? How did you start? Okay. So I would say that I started in university, mm-hmm. in college, really. Mm-hmm. Um, I started as a young woman who all of a sudden, you know, you had noticed things because I grew up, you know, I'm Nigerian, I grew up in Nigeria. There were a lot of things you noticed as a girl growing mm-hmm. up in Nigeria that kind of makes you ponder mm-hmm. about why society is different mm-hmm. and uh, why do we relate the behaviors of girls and women differently. Mm-hmm. And, you know, secondary school, you're kind of learning a little bit more And then you get to college and you realize that a lot of it is guided by legal frameworks Mm -hmm. and societal forms that we often don't name specifically. And I realize that there's a way to influence that, Mm -hmm. that there's actually people who study these and we don't want to influence and change that and shift that. So Mm -hmm. I went from being a biochem major to to doing this work. And since then, I've been in civil society. Mm -hmm. But what we mean to... Hello? I moved back to Nigeria. And in 2015, I don't know if people remember, the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill was thrown out mm-hmm. of the Nigerian Senate. And mm-hmm. there was a lot of conversations around how it's going to you know, increase prostitution mm-hmm. and lesbianism. <laughs> and that's how I started with a couple of women in my life, Father Kemi, who founded mm-hmm. um, Education as a Vaccine, Taratu, um, who is also an amazing um, young woman who does a lot of work around agricultural policy mm-hmm. and gender. And so we started having a conversation about why aren't young women part of this conversation? Mm-hmm. Why aren't we driving to push for laws that would protect us from discrimination and violence? Mm-hmm. And literally that's how I started. And hey, how many years later was in the struggle and in the fight. We're in the struggle. Aluta continu- Aluta continua. All right, we've got Dami o- on the line now. Dami, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, sorry about the mix-up with the ID and all of that. Um, sorry, it's no problem. It's not even from your end, to be honest. Um, I should have let you know ahead of time that I had two Skypes. <laughs> I forgot I had an extra one. <laughs> I think we've all moved on from Skype. Everybody's zooming now. Uh, but uh, yeah. l- let's talk. Let's talk very quickly. So so far, we've just gotten to know everybody. We've talked to Tolulok where she told us what she does, why she does it. We've talked to Buki. Buki told us what she does, why she does it. So let's talk to you, Dami. But you're going to need to fix your settings and uh, make it landscape so that everybody who's watching can can see you properly now um let's talk about market march what triggered you to to found market march what did the process look like um so it was is this is the screen better now i think so but my team will let me know if if they don't think so go ahead okay okay (laughs) <laughs> um, so for Market Match, I, I think basically it was just a very spontaneous um, um, thing. Hmm. It was a conversation online about like harassment and everybody was like their own parents experienced the same thing, their own moms experienced the same thing, they hmm. experienced the same thing and the people that were older than me were saying they experienced the same thing. Hmm. So I was like, this has been happening for so long. Why is, why is it still happening? Like, is it impossible to do something? Mm-hmm. Like, why? Mm-hmm. And obviously a protest for me was like the best way to go about it for now because mm-hmm. at the time I was I don't know anybody I don't have any connections mm-hmm. um but at least I can go out carry my placards invite other women mm-hmm. and we can actually make a statement that this is not okay mm-hmm. for us the main goal at the time was how do we make a statement that it's not okay because it was so normalized mm-hmm. that I think even the the perpetrators they had gotten so comfortable they were so used to acting that way they were mm. so shocked that people were even going to come out to actually protest something like this it was just a for me a spontaneous moment that how how do we make the clearest statement to these people that we don't like this mm. this is not okay this mm. is not acceptable mm. you know my first week at this job which was also my first month in lagos i talked on this show about how i was heckled and harassed on my first trip to a market here in lagos and i remember at the time my co-anchor at the time a man told me ah he didn't think that that kind of thing happened often like that and i told him that he should ask the women in his lives 
right? They're going to tell him different. Now, some months down the line, we had Market March. That's how I met you. I invited you onto the show to talk about it. Why is this behavior so rampant, do you think? What do you think is ultimately the most effective strategy for ending harassment in the market? And for people who are listening to the, to the show and they don't understand what I mean by harassment in the market, I mean how women will go to the market and men will be dragging them, my color, my wife, my skin, my this, my this, come here. Some will drag your, your, your hands, some will grope you in the market and, and things like that. Dami? Um, to be honest, I don't know of a clear cut strategy to solve it. Hmm. All I know is there's different things that we can do, um, different stones we can throw at this brick wall. Hmm. Um, in terms of like what we have approached it with hmm. so far, mm -hmm. we done obviously protests um i've tried conversations with like um the police stations they have on on, on for instance in yaba for instance mm -hmm. um how we like operating markets in collaboration with like i said um we we've been able to converse with some of the markets associations mm -hmm. um so it's it's different strategies i'm um, talking to people they look up to like for instance the um religious leaders at the market because they do have like fellowships and stuff like that mm. um to, to yeah to pass it across in their messages mm. and recently what we plan to do was um with the situation we have now with covid um, we're thinking of like sharing masks at for instance yaba market um, along with like pamphlets educating them on sexual harassment as a crime mm. um, because I think a lot of them they know it's wrong at this point but they don't know that it's a crime mm. um, or they don't want to believe it so we want to share um, pamphlets um, with content written in pidgin English and regular English with them with masks as well mm. uh, just so that because it's, it's, a, it's a balance of militancy and diplomacy in one moment is a protest <laughs> i like how yeah, i like that I it's a balance of militancy and diplomacy i love that i should that's a that's a quotable yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's no one strategy we don't know the answers we're very open to suggestions um but it's going to be a long-term thing mm. um a very long-term dedicated thing because it's very cultural mm. Okay. All right. Let's move the conversation uh, along to widows, right? Because it's a series I've been on for the past few weeks. For the last few Wednesdays on the glass ceiling, I've been exploring the cultural attacks that widows endure. Last uh, week, for instance, we talked about the widowhood rights, right? To, to, to uh, quote prove that they did not kill their husbands. That's what we talked about last week. We also talked about how men's families seize their widow's um, property, right? And uh, Tolu has even started by sharing examples of some of her friends who have lost uh, uh, family members, right? So I, I, I want us to, to talk about that a bit. Tolu, I'll start with you. W what do you think are the reasons why widows endure so much abuse, so much oppression, so much degradation in our society? Why do you think that is, Tolu? Your mic is mute. You need to put your mic on. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, Thank I can. You. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I, I think that there are, there are multiple factors involved. Hmm. And to a very large extent, I suspect that ignorance plays a large part. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, I also suspect that... So you know how our society sort of presents it as it's the man who does everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So you see um, a nuclear family, for example, who are doing relatively well. And the immediate assumption is that it's the man who funds everything. Right. Even where the woman seems to be doing well, society expects her to couch that under the umbrella of her husband. OK. Right. So that when okay. something then happens to that man, the assumption is that everything really belongs to the man hmm. right and because of the society that we live in right hmm. the extended family or the man's family will then step up to say this is our son it's no longer your husband <laughs> the conversation becomes is our son therefore 
we have a right to talk about the things that he left for the family. That is the instance when they remember that the immediate family that the man has is his mother, his father, his uncles, and whoever who most likely did not contribute, perhaps in the immediate term, while he was building up his family and the wealth or properties that he left behind, right? So I think that's that's the first thing. The other part is, in some instances, some of us as women, perhaps we're obviously not working, or they just assume that we are fully dependent on the man, and therefore you can really do anything that you want. She's not really our child, mm -hmm. right? You know how you come into the family, you actually accept a name. You are not born into that family, so there's still, to an extent, a sense of you are not really a part of it. Hmm. For example, you have some families who do maybe at the end of the year they do family meetings. Hmm. The wives are sometimes not part of such family meetings. Hmm. I always found it strange, hmm. right? Hmm. I can't be a part of family meetings in my husband's house. I can't be a part of family team family meetings in my father's house because I'm now married to another family. So you're internally and at displaced. The end of the day, I'm practically just on my own, <laughs> right? And you may even have children. And then they will say that the, your children will be part of some family meetings in their father's house. And me, who brought them to this world, you tell me, um, as a wife, you go and stay in the kitchen, or you people go and continue cooking. We, the members of the family, want to have a conversation. Mm. It sounds strange, but that's the reality, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And outside me being maybe, of course, as a child, being exposed to such conversations after my father died, mm -hmm. reality don't me when one of my best friends lost her husband. We are just finished school, mm. right? So mm. sometimes, you know, we have these conversations. It feels very far off, mm. like, what are you really talking about? Mm. And that's probably how, how it was for me until reality dawned. I had a friend who was 26, mm. and she had lost her husband. And then we started talking about, so how are you going to how are you going to do? He had pension in the account. He had property, X, Y, Z. How are you going to manage it? Mm. And you're talking about that at 26, right? It mm. sounds very strange, but that's the reality of a lot of young people today, mm. right? So the first thing I would say is that perhaps it's not very obvious that the woman is maybe, she's not very educated. Mm. There's ignorance on the part of family members. Perhaps the woman is also not very assertive, right? You are the one who, when they're having family functions, you are the one cooking from morning till night. You are packing all the soup. You are the one washing all the plates at family functions. Of course, when they are, talk, when they are going to talk about serious things, they will tell you to go to the kitchen. <laughs> and because when they were talking about serious things before, you were always in the in kitchen. In the kitchen. Bukola, do you agree? <laughs> Put your mic on, Bukola. Do you agree? I, I, I yes, now we can hear you. Okay, great. I said she's speaking to what the reality is, right? She's using the examples and, and the stories. And it just to show this is why we actually have laws, right? Against this widowhood practices. That's mm. one of the reasons why we've been putting pushing for the domestication and the violence against persons revision act. Mm. Because this is one of those harmful traditional practices that we see around widowhood where people are forced to drink water from the corpse of their husbands, their heads being shaved, mm. losing inheritance and property. And, you know, interesting on gender level of potential deals, this was one of the sticking points, right? Mm. That a woman should be able to inherit whatever property exists around them. People saying, well, no, culture says this, religion says that. This is what should determine it. And I think, you know, just going back, all of those examples that she's making and putting, it just goes back to, let's go back to the root cause, is the fact that we live in a gender unequal society, mm. right? Mm -hmm. We believe the lives of men and boys has more value than the lives of women and girls. And so that occurs both in life and in death. It doesn't change because we don't see the same thing happening to men whose wives die. Hmm. You know, it was also a conversation that you had, Sandra, about remarriage mm -hmm. after the death of a And see the vitriol you faced because of that. Mm -hmm. If it was, oh, can my friend remarry? It would have been like... Who would take care of his home? Mm. Who would cook for him? Mm. All of these things 
right? Because we believe the right of the man is to be taken care of by a woman. So it goes back to the root cause, which is just gender inequality hmm. in our society. Uh, Dami yeah. Lola, Lola, do you agree that um, these are the reasons uh, widows endure so much abuse and oppression and degradation in our society? Absolutely. Um, I, 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 it's, it's just the irony of it all. At the end of the day, when you look at only call societies, they don't tend to make a lot of sense. Um, before you get married, you are told that when you're married, um, you have to give yourself into the marriage as a woman. Hmm. Um, oftentimes, you have to sacrifice so much, whether it's your career, whether it's um, your time. And the idea behind that is that you're both building a life together. Hmm. Um, you're making all of these sacrifices and compromises to build a life with this man. Hmm. But it's just funny that when something happens, a tragedy and the man dies, all of a sudden, all the things they convinced you about the reality of your life as a wife hmm. goes out of the window. Hmm. It's no more a life you built together. It's a life that he built. And I think it's just the invisibility of like women's labor again. Hmm. Um, oftentimes, a lot of the labor that, um, as she mentioned, for instance, um, the cooking, the cleaning, I think it's very easy for us to minimize the impact of some of those things mm -hmm. and what they have, the effect they have on the lives of men. Mm -hmm. um, studies after studies have shown that married men, they have better job opportunities, better promotions, more recreational time um, than even their single counterparts. They're happier than their single counterparts because somebody else is taking all of the emotional and physical labor for them to be able to have that kind of life. Hmm. So oftentimes the contributions that women bring oftentimes into the development of men, oftentimes sacrificing their own ability to be quote unquote fully independent. Hmm. Sometimes all of that is invisible. So it becomes property of the man, which is just, I feel like it's completely counter to what we have said marriage to be, especially in contemporary Nigeria where we're not fully custom married um we're not fully um english at the same time we're just practicing like some mix mm. of the two of them mm. this is like the traditional the mix everything it's like any any way in our way <laughs> any way in our way <laughs> <laughs> so we, we then get the brunt of this chaos at the end of the day which like they said is just a reflection of inequality gender inequality makes women's labor invisible makes women's plight invisible and it gives complete ownership to men in everything, including the sacrifices that women make. Men take ownership of the reward of that, and that reflects in death, which, mm. which, is, which is what we're seeing here. The most unfortunate. Uh, um, uh, yeah. uh, all right, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and continue this conversation. I want to find out what we can do because my intention today is show that young people are doing the work. We're having the conversations and we're actually putting in the, the, walk, the work. We're not just um, talking. We're walking the talk, right? So let's, uh, let's talk solutions after this break. If you just joined the show, hello. You're listening to Hard Facts on 99.3 Nigeria Info. It's International Youth Day, hello. and so I have young women on the show who are are talking to us about how we can protect the rights of widows. My first guest is um, the founder of Market March. Uh, it's a movement that is working to end harassment of women in marketplaces and other public spaces. Her name is Damilola Marcus. My second guest is the executive director of education as a vaccine, Bukola Williams. And my third guest is the founder of Nigerian Women in PR. She's a public relations and communications consultant. She's a retail business advisor to Lulokbe Olorundero. Let's talk some more on the other side. This is the Glass Ceiling on Hard Facts. Hard facts.
This is the glass ceiling, the glass ceiling. on hard facts. Hard facts. All right, Lagos 99.3 Nigeria Info. I am Sandra Ezekwasili, and we are right here on International Youth Day having a conversation with young women who are fighting to ensure that women in this country get their due. I'm talking about the executive director of education as a vaccine, Buki. I'm also talking about the founder of Nigerian Women in PR. She's a public relations and communications consultant to look where Olorundero. And I'm also talking about Damilola Marcus, who's the founder of Market March. She's also a design expert. You should see her work. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> now, before the break, uh, we talked a bit about what you thought um were the reasons why widows endure so much abuse, so much oppres- uh, oppression, so much uh, degradation in our society. You know, one of the things that became clear to me uh, while talking about this topic on this show for the last few weeks is that a lot of Nigerians don't really believe that a man and uh, a woman in a marriage together have the same property rights. They believe that the woman's property belongs to the husband after she dies, but that his property belongs to the husband after she dies. His property always is your husband's house, even after he dies, long after he dies. This discrepancy, is it also as a result of gender inequality, Tolu Lokbe, or is there something else, Tolu? Put your mic on. Uh... Honestly, I think everything boils down from comes from there. <laughs> Every everything comes from there, really, right? Where, even where uh, you have a very young boy in the family, he says still still takes precedence over what an older woman in the same family would say, right? So imagine that a woman is married into a family and. And then her husband is dead and the man had a very much younger brother right he can stay somewhere and actually dictate what happens so his brother's property even he, even though the wife is alive and much way older than he is right mm. and the whole family would support this young boy mm. um, so i think that fundamentally um just like i think dami said earlier it's really about not appreciating and even recognizing the value and of the labor of the woman right everything is subsumed under a man it feels like if there's no man around then there's nothing no matter how much that's what society wants us to accept right where no matter how much you work no matter how much you labor everything still belongs to a man in your life hmm. right you really have you don't have any right to anything and for me at this point really because obviously, except we want to lie to ourselves, that's what the reality is. Okay. As, I think as, as a PR whole... person, Tolu, um, what do you think we are getting wrong when it comes to communicating to other Nigerians that these things being done to women, to widows, are wrong? How do we win the hearts and the minds of everybody on this particular uh, 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 issue? Mm, I think it's constant communication and more women speaking out. That's why what Market Match um, Dami is doing and what Bukola is doing is fantastic. The first, you know how they say that when you educate a woman, you I don't, is it educate a community or a generation, something like that? Mm-hmm. We as women first need to understand, internalize and accept that we are individuals in our own rights. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. Because really, if you understand who you are Mm -hmm. as a human being, right, there are just some things that you will not accept, even if you are being offered it. Mm. Do you understand? Mm. So there is this first part of even exposing the women to this understanding first. It's not really about letting the men or one society know about it. Because yes, the man can, it could it could just be like a handout mm. if it's only what the man says that he gives to you. No, that language is even... So there's also the language of communicating these things, mm. right? You want society to give it to you. You want, you want the men to accept you. That language is very subservient. Mm. Okay, so there's a language, number one, that we use to communicate this thing. And then there is that part where as women... If you're an older woman, 
take it as a personal responsibility to educate and empower a younger woman that is around you, right? Let her come into a, a full sense of herself, okay? As a human being first, because right from when you are young, when you are at home, even your mother, right, mm. is, I don't know, either society or for whatever reason or the way she has been brought up, she's conditioning your mind to let you know that you really are not anything if you are not in a man's house, mm. right? So that type of indoctrination is not just coming on Twitter one day and then I see one empowering tweet and then I suddenly say I'm free. <laughs> it doesn't work like that, okay? So it's something that you are at home, you are an elder sister, you have a younger sister, you, you are talking about it. Mm. You are a boss, you have female um, colleagues, you are talking about it, you are living the life. And this is not being brashy or being, uh, this is not being brash or being rude or being loud. Mm. It's just living a life that is evident that you understand who you are as a human being. Mm. And then, of course, if you are now in a relationship, you are married, you make sure that that understanding is first completely understood with your spouse. Mm. Okay? Completely understood with your spouse. He has properties, he has whatever. Make sure that you are aware of it. If you are not, because the other part is, it now feels like, oh, so my husband has died now. Oh, God for baby. <laughs> and then I'm just, I, I'm, I'm insisting that if I don't get his properties, heavens will break loose. No. Right? So there's that part where I can de demand it as a right. But when I know that I also have my own properties, I'm not going to kill myself over something. Do you understand? Okay. So there is this part of you demanding your right and then this of you knowing that whether this thing is accessible to me or not, mm. life continues and I can survive and thrive regardless. Okay, because I also get the sense of sometimes we, we just want to... Um, push some conversations just for pushing sake. Hmm. That's honestly how it comes across, right? Where we are all just talk and there is really no substance or action hmm. behind it, hmm. right? Like I said, I my, my mother became a widow when I was 10 and I can still remember some of the things that she did. We lived in Ikoi where um, the, the flat that we were, we were staying hmm. was assigned to my father who was a civil servant at that time. Hmm. So of course, by, by the time he, he, he died, it was going to be passed on to another colleague in a his office mm -hmm. where my mom also because of that level at that time was also entitled to get in that position mm. she didn't go about crying right it was just act and by the time we did the burial the flat was already in her name do you understand mm. so it's not just going around crying to the family acted they were going to give the gratuity some of my father's um, siblings were coming up mm. to say blah 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 my god <laughs> i i remember in his own like i was told later mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i just know that she stood in the places where she should stand it's not just screaming about and tearing shirts mm -hmm. and saying that this is my right and we are going to protest act if you understand that that's who you are just act it out act it just out. act it out huh. and it's not uh, okay that's what i believe uh, buki uh, buki as a professional um how do you think the advocacy around widow's rights should be directed uh, do you agree first of all with uh, the things that tolu has said who do you think are the key stakeholders that need to be convinced to be influenced to be coerced even to ensure that the rights of women and the rights of widows are respected so uh, you know when Often when we talk about an ecological model mm. that is put out there, right, that looks at the different, the different layers of where the change needs to happen. Mm. So if you're looking at the issue around widowhood, which is true for harmful traditional practices, mm -hmm. so you're looking at the, you know, the societal level, right? Mm -hmm. That's all of us together, how we interact with each other, what are the things that guide our behaviors and the ways we interact with each other. Then there's also the institutional, right, which mm. gives the legal frameworks that was referring to which is the different laws mm. so we have customary laws we have british law we have islamic law we have so many different laws that are guiding mm -hmm. guiding all of them. and then we have the interpersonal mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. which is at relationship which is at the level of the family members and so change has to happen at all of those levels and it just depends we have to look at nigeria and we can't look at nigeria as a whole we're all we we all come from very different communities the inheritance in my community is very different i'm from lagos state so mm. it can't even be for all your 
you know, um, you come from a different part, you come from the north, the south, the southwest, even within there, there's so much diversity. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work that we have to do is really looking and saying, how does it work? Because in some cultures, it is not as pervasive as in other cultures, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That different. An example that she's sharing is that she, their parents were living in Lagos State. Hmm. So it's a little different. If it was a woman in a rural area, she wouldn't have access to any of those things that her mom had. And hmm. how do we look, you know, out for that rural woman? It's by going down to the community level and ensuring that the community leaders, one, understand why this is an issue, see from the perspective of the woman and realize that this is harmful hmm. and be part of that change because they influence change at those community levels you know when you look at who do nigerians trust the most religious leaders always top the list mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. you know and even to political leaders so when we have religious leaders who are also speaking um from their pulpit from you know the affairs and the imams are also speaking and you have the traditional leaders you know, who are also, you know, traditional religious people who are also speaking and being like, this is wrong. That under our God, the person that we worship, we believe that women should earn this, right? To show that they can be able to either take care of their families, whatever this issue is. They also need to change that narrative hmm. before the ordinary person on the I mean, there, there was a report done by Voices for Change mm -hmm. years ago called take the time to read that report a little bit hmm. because one of the things it shows that men and boys were willing to change they understood what they needed to do but they felt like if they did it society was going to judge them outsiders were going to judge them by like now man you be they do this kind of thing hmm. you understand so yeah but but who is society society is me and you and other men so which men want to change and which members of society will judge them for changing <laughs> When they're in their house, uh -huh. they'll be willing to wash dishes. But if another man comes, uh -huh. or when Pastor Adeboye puts on Twitter and says, if I have a meeting <laughs> and my wife is doing a meeting, she will leave her meeting to come to my meeting. You two, will you not tell your wife, come to my meeting? <laughs> Those kind of different way of like, maybe Pastor Sam Adeyemi saying, look, you know, if my wife needs to take a break or something, mm -hmm. I will also make sure that I look after the, the children we have together mm -hmm. so that she can go out and do that. Changing the narrative. There was this funny TikTok video that this young lady did that was talking about an Afa who was, you know, mad at men who were impregnating their wives without planning for the child's future. Mm. So that's a different direction because normally you look at the woman and be like, why are you having so many children? Mm -hmm. Instead, he was looking at the man and being like, are you having so many children that you did not plan for? Hmm. So it's about really shifting that narrative by key influences where people listen to because we have frames through which we understand the world. Mm -hmm. And if when if I am the one going to talk to the people in that affairs most, they will look at me and be like, ah, Western agenda. Hmm. But if it's a coming and saying it, they'll be like, ah, your wisdom. <laughs> your wisdom. You understand? <laughs> Things. Or if we change the way we teach curriculum in schools, uh -huh. where you don't be like mother, father, mother cooks, father drives car, goes to office. Uh -huh. it's, it's the little places that those changes need to happen. Hmm. Do you understand that mommy and daddy work? Even if mommy is at home, mm -hmm. unpaid care work is work. Mm -hmm. It's part of the model of a nation. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that then children will understand that and then it would there would be a recognition of it mm -hmm. that families also start to rise not just the late like both labor mm -hmm. so those are levels in which it also has to work and it has to interact together mm -hmm. we can't just do one or the other so that's why we need everybody mm -hmm. you know not just who have made it our you know our lives our work. calling we need every <laughs> we need everybody so, you each one teach one. Mm -hmm. We need that commitment. You, you know, from everybody this, thing, this thing you mentioned about school reminds me of a story. Uh, so I was talking to a two year old and, uh, you know, I taught her that, you know, a woman could be, a, I, ta I taught him, sorry, that a woman could be a doctor, a man could be a nurse. And then he, he gets to school 
And they teach him in class that, you know, the guy wearing the stethoscope is the doctor. The woman wearing the stethoscope is the nurse. And so she comes mm-hmm. home. He, he comes home and, you know, he, sa- he says to me, um, so this is what they taught us in school. And I said to him, yeah, but that's not what I taught you at home, though. He's like, yeah, but so that's why I was confused, you see, because, like, you taught me a different thing and my teacher is teaching me a different thing. So it's very important what you've said, uh, um, uh, Abu Kola, that each one has to reach one. We, it's, it's a job that we all have to do. Now, I'm going to wrap up with, with you, Dami, because we're completely out of time. You are somebody who got in the faces of people in the market. You basically got in their faces and you said to them, enough is enough, right? These are basically people who have been harassing women in the markets for decades. What's your approach for getting these people to do the right thing? And do you think that approach can be applied to these traditional groups that Buki has mentioned so that we can get behavioral change going? Yes, I, I, I do think so. I, I think that there is everything, in, like I said earlier, is a mix of at some point you have to stand and at another point you have to be a little bit more understanding mm. that culture is going to take a lot of time to change, to a change. lot of effort and enthusiasm. Um, so it's a balance of both. We, the, the, the traders, for instance, or not even the traders, because if you speak to some of the traders, they'll tell you it's not the traders that are harassing women, it's the touts that are on the road that are harassing women. They'll shall push the blame to, to somebody else. Mm. But at the end of the day, the, the, yeah, the point is, the people who are doing these things, there is the shame. If you make this something of shame, that they shouldn't be doing this, they would resist doing it because we're social beings as human beings. Mm. So when you can have a conversation one-on-one with someone and you're like, why do you um, just in the market? And he's saying, no, I'm not the one who does it. It's this other person who does it. That's already giving you the um, understanding that these people already process this as something that is shameful for them to do. Mm. Same thing that I would think of in this situation. Um, we have to have a zero tolerance for it morally um for family members that come and harass um um, um widows for, for people who come and try and take destroy pretty much a life that a woman is trying to piece together after she has lost a loved one mm. if there is a moral um conversation around that i think that that would be very important also like she said it's about everybody being sensitized and being aware of this everybody has a part to play in this mm. um one of the things we noticed, for instance, in the very first match was that the women, some of the women, they joined us, but some of the women, they didn't join us. Mm. Um, and, I, and, I, and I found that to be very interesting because some of the women were like, well done. And they thought the women, other women joined the men to be like, um, but it's also useful now that we're this sort of thing to the market, blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then it, it made me realize the reality. The reality is that not everybody will be able to on board mm-hmm. and that's fine but we have to still try because the more people are on board the mere fact that some women agreed with us mm-hmm. was enough mm-hmm. and of course criminalizing uh, currently on uh, like up until the federal law level you are not supposed to a woman has a right to a bit of her husband's property mm-hmm. um on them mm-hmm. right but we need to go beyond that i'm thinking <laughs> that might be a radical but i'm thinking even criminalizing the act of going to bully her out of it because there is societal pressure that can make women give into even irrespective of what the law even say. Mm-hmm. So I think that you're putting also the body of people to also act right that you'll be criminalized. If you go and you try and bully a woman out of the property mm-hmm. that she has a right to mm-hmm. you face the consequences of the law. So that for me will also be another another, another way to get the changes that we want. Ladies, I would like to thank you so much yeah. for joining us on the show. Bukala Williams, uh, Damilola Marcus, and Tolulokwe Olorundero. You, you, you have been amazing. I'm going to get you all back on this show some other time so that we can have future conversations. But I need to switch gears and talk about technology now. I've got a year Boyeji coming and uh, we're going to talk about how young people are creating jobs for other young people. Thank you so much for joining us on The Glass Ceiling. Thank you. Lagos, stay right here. Don't go away. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, it's okay. Let me explain. It's okay. It's okay. She, she, she. mic. On 99.3 Nigeria Info, your mic is always on. 